All right, we're back again. Good day, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on what time you're watching this. But we are back with another episode, The Daily Show by Discovery Day Program. And uh, it's a show about interesting facts and trivia for everyone's daily knowledge. And I think I'm going to start saying that again because... I don't know, that's kind of like my signature intro back in the day, you know, unless I can come up with something new. For August 31st, which is last day of um, August, um, good job guys, good job for uh, sticking with us for another month again and I can't believe it's August is over. Now we're uh, heading for September, where uh, the next time that I'll see you guys in one of our episodes. Um, and then after September, we got October, November, December, and then, oh my gosh, just a few more years before the end of 2021. I don't know. I don't know. I always um, find the days uh, to, to be flying so fast. Is it just me? Let's go back to our topics for today. Uh, we'll talk about, for today, we'll talk about memoirs. You know, um, have you heard of that word or have you made a memoir of yourself well what uh, hold on before you answer uh, you know we'll, we'll talk about that and the uh, observances um, some other things being nice to others you know I mean I guess we should talk about it or well because obviously it's gonna be part of the observance but being nice to others should be like a like a default like a, like a given you know we should always always be nice to others regardless of what day or what observances we talk about uh, Something, another good thing, trail mix. I don't know if you guys are a fan of trail mix, but we'll discuss that in the uh, observances. And then for our history, we'll talk about the uh, very early form of cameras or video recorders. Then, um, place of the week, we'll talk about the national symbols of Singapore introduced by Liz yesterday. And as usual, stay tuned for our stuff of the day. So, okay, moving on today, today's observances. <laughs> Well, I was going to say today in observances, but yeah, today's observances is way better. All right, the first one I just mentioned a while ago, we love Memoirs Day. So it was first created in 2013 by two memoir authors, Victoria Tweed and Alan Parks. Um, while observing this observance, you might ask, isn't a memoir similar to a diary or aren't they kind of like... Uh, essentially the same you know well they're actually different uh, when, when you say diaries uh, it's basically when, when you write something in a diary it's usually written as a record or record of events you know you, you record what happened this day what specifically happened how, what was your response to that event and all you know and you kind of uh, uh, maintain it uh, there, there's a, it's very frequent that you you write something in your diary, you know, um, more like it's, it's, it's a daily thing, like day one and then day two and stuff like that. And it, it has a frequent intervals. Um, memoirs, however, are not personal narratives and not single moments. So the main difference, <clears throat> well, you're still going to be writing about, let's say yourself, but you, you're the events on that day. On a specific day is not the focus of uh, memoirs it's, it's the focus of the diary but for memoirs um it's all about the plot the plot or uh the the theme of 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 uh what you're trying to accomplish you know and, and then what you're gonna do is you're gonna write the pattern or well actually not a pattern but the events that actually meets that criteria meets that pattern um that kind of binds those moments together you know um it's kind of hard to explain, but to make things easier, uh, when you write out your diary, uh, the specific uh, you will specifically write the day and then the events, right? But when you write a memoir, uh, you focus on a plot. For example, uh, you wanted your memoir to be like a, a story about success. There you go, a story about a success. Um, so what you're going to do is you're going to be writing the moments that affected your success or that influenced your your uh, success so some of those may be events that you considered uh, the lowest point in your life but then you overcame it 
And then you may also include events where you were supported by other people, your family, your significant other, uh, your friends, uh, re you know, help you reach the top of your goal or basically your goal, you know, the, the summit of the mountain you were trying to climb right there. So you don't have to like say day one, this is what I did day two. You're basically just going to pick, you're going to pick uh, uh, a time or a point in your life that, okay, hey, yeah, this is how my story started when I was young. And then you're not going to go day by day. You're gonna, you, you may skip to when you were in high school, right there. And then you may skip again to your, uh, let's say college and then your, your current life. And then um, by doing that, you kind of um, get the, the, uh, the story you're trying to, or you kind of will be able to give the story you wanted to share, which is your story of success. So and that's the main difference. I, I guess I, I'm sorry if I wasn't able to explain it um, better, but that's how I see what a memoir is, you know, uh, definitely. Uh, totally different than a diary. Um, the day could be celebrated by thinking about writing your own memoir. So I, if you guys are up uh, for the challenge or um, if you don't have time to write it, then uh, you can try to come up uh, in your mind, you know, how uh, think of a plot, uh, focus on something like, let's say, you want to focus on the same thing where uh, you wanted to share like how successful you became. Uh, or maybe your theme is overcoming obstacles. There we go. Now you can talk about your obstacles when you were young, uh, when you were somewhere, when you were with a friend, or if you shared the same obstacle as any of your friends, you know? And um, I think memoirs for me, for me, I think it's easier, but I guess other people can argue that diary is easier because you kind of like write it or, or record it right away, right? But um for me memories that i mean we don't remember everything right but there are things that we uh tend to remember more than others just because it, it actually influences you in some way and uh, the reason why i'm saying the memoirs are easier to do or to to write about is because you if i guess it feels good going back to to these memories that you had, these experiences that you had that actually uh, affected you. Um, I guess in a, well, I'm gonna say in a good way. So in a good way. Yeah, there you go. So yeah, here's the challenge for you guys. We can um, write something or think about a plot and then try to connect some points in your life to to uh, that that meets that theme, that plot right there. And it's probably not gonna be easy, but I think for me it's easier. I mean, just saying, I don't know. All right, next up we got Touch a Heart Tuesday. There you go, Touch a Heart Tuesday is our next observance that we're gonna be talking about. And this is this has something to do with being nice to others because I mean, you know, from what it's from what it sounds like, you're not literally going to touch someone's heart, but you're going to uh, uh, show kindness to others. There you go. Um, in fact, this is an opportunity to remind people that, hey, you know, as humans, we have to be kind to one another and especially other animals to other creatures, which we always talk about here in our daily show, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, um, this observance had a uh, sad uh, origin. There's a sad origin about this, but of course, I just wanted to share it. To you guys not not to make you feel sad but you, so you have an idea uh why this observance was made all right so jara or jara created the week in 1988 after reading a story about two young men in her town of tom's river new jersey who had flipped over in a row boat um the two ladies from another boat pulled them out of the cold water but their boat was not motorized and they didn't have a radio to call for help now uh, another uh, two boats with the radio antennas passed and unfortunately they didn't stop for help. Um, a person from one of those boats apparently even said, we don't want to be bothered. You know, it's, it's kind of sad uh, having uh, those kinds of people um, uh, not being able to help out. And also another thing is that they refuse actually. I think that's 
that's a better way to put it uh, that they refuse to help you know um, one of one of the uh, two boaters who had fallen in the water ended up passing away because of uh, being cold for a long time uh, Jara uh, was devastated by what had happened in her town and wanted to honor the memory of the uh, person who who passed away so that's why she started uh, this weekly observance or not weekly observance this observance for the whole week be kind to humankind week again uh, for me it's again it's a little sad to have a reminder for us to be kind you know um, but that's the reality and uh, we just have to keep on moving uh, forward and be positive uh, thinking you know thinking positively and trying our best you know it, it, it is definitely a struggle to to keep being kind especially for the, those people who are not kind to you it's definitely gonna be a challenge but at the end of the day you know uh, if if we try our best to be uh, kind as much as possible then the world's gonna be a better place yes there you go uh, oh one more thing since we are celebrating be kind to humankind week uh, you know you may have few more days until next week you know to show kindness to to people around you so yeah there you go all right next would be uh trail mix i love trail mix except for the um the the prunes i'm not a good uh, i'm not a big fan of prunes but uh the rest i'm okay uh let's see what we got there, there there's definitely a lot there's definitely a lot of uh mix in there mixed nuts but today is for any kinds of trail mix you know this day is dedicated to the snack mix of all that well, we all love which was conceived uh, to be taken along hikes yes it is easy to carry and usually nutritious it says i did say usually because sometimes you know you would bring uh what do you call it you, you you would bring some snacks when you're hiking but they're not really healthy snacks um yeah <laughs> so there you go um often containing raisins which i'm not a fan of again i did say nuts i'm okay granola definitely okay um chocolate is also often added um it's also least at least been around since 1910 when it was mentioned by horace kephart's the book of camping and woodcraft in many european countries it is known as student snack or student food while I, I kind of had to pause because when it, when it said student snack, it kind of reminded me of my snack or actually my meal when I was in college. Uh, but <laughs> definitely not healthy. I've been eating uh, instant noodles when I was in college and and uh, 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 rushing all my my projects and stuff. Oh man, I, I you know what? I would have been better idea if I got trail mix instead of uh, instant noodles all day all all the time so there you go um also many hikers refer to trail mix as gorp this may be an acronym for good old raisins and peanuts good old raisins and peanuts gorp or or it could also be granola oats raisins and peanuts so your choice your choice of uh, gorp you know so anyways what's your favorite trail mix brand for me, I don't really have a specific brand of trail mix. I, as long my, my only requirement is as long as it doesn't have any raisins, because I'm not. Uh, I don't like prunes. I don't like raisins, and uh, I know they are healthy. I know they are healthy, but it's it's just my personal preference, right there. If you guys like the ra if you guys like raisins, then hey, I, I'll give you guys a thumbs up for uh, doing better than me. There you go. Um, okay, we don't have any um, other notable observances, uh, so we're gonna go straight to uh, today in history. All right, we got this 19 or oh, 1897 right there. Thomas Edison patents the kinetograph. I hope I pronounced that right. Kinetograph, right there. Uh, in 1890s. Uh, Edison had developed the, the camera, this kind of camera, and yes, uh, this kind of like an early form of camera, and it's viewer. Um, so he patented uh, a camera, a, a type of uh, early version of cameras, and then you cannot just watch it without a viewer. So uh, these days, if you want to see your picture 
uh, your viewer will be either your smartphone, your computer, your TV, you know, because they, they're the ones that displays the, uh, the photos or videos that you take. Um, but yeah, back in the day, it comes in a pair, uh, camera and then the viewer, and staged and Edison staged several demonstrations. Now, unlike these earlier cameras, Edison's kinetoscope and kinetograph used celluloid film invented by George Eastman in 1889. In February 1893, Edison built a small movie studio that could be rotated and capture the best available sunlight. He showed the first demonstration of his films featuring three of his workers uh, pretending to be blacksmiths in um, May 1893. Sorry. Now that, that invention inspired French inventors Louis and August Lumiere to develop a uh, movie camera and projector, the cinematograph. And I'm not confident with how you pronounce it again, but I think I would say cinematograph. There you go. Cinematograph. Like cinema and then to graph. <laughs> um, that allowed a large audience to view a film. Um, several other cameras and projectors were also developed in the late 1800s. There you go. We have one more for today in history. We got 1935 FDR signs the Neutrality Act. Now, this one, uh, he calls it an expression of desire to avoid any action that might involve uh, this country, the U.S., in war. <clears throat> the signing came at a time when newly installed uh, governments or fascist governments in Europe were beginning to beat the drums of war. Um, although the legislation uh, stated that the U.S. intended to stay out of the foreign wars, Roosevelt insisted that the country could not foresee future situations in which um, the U.S. might have to amend its neutral stance, noting that uh, history is filled with unforeseeable situations that call for some flexibility of action. So, not because <clears throat> FDR signs the Neutrality Act, meaning that uh, he's not going to take sides. It doesn't mean that he, uh, what do you call this, that, that they're not allowed to help friendly countries or allied countries with the U.S. You know, Roosevelt contended that the law would not prevent the U.S. from cooperating. There you go, cooperating with other similarly minded governments to promote peace. So, um, in other words, he left plenty of room for America to change its mind regarding assisting allied countries and gave it the right to exercise options to protect uh, its own country, the you know, government's own country, which is the U.S. There you go. All right, moving on, notable figure born today, we have the first one on the list, 1870, Maria Montessori. So she is the founder of the Montessori method of education. And uh, I could say they um, we got schools that are named after her in our country and that's where I spend half of my uh, grade school. So from grades 1 to 3 if I'm not mistaken before transferring to another school. But yeah, I remember I remember her last name and yes, uh, I guess I'm proud that <laughs> I went to her school, you know. And then next up we have... <clears throat> Frederick March, 1897. Uh, he was born in Wisconsin. He's an American actor, famously known uh, for his roles in the movies Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and The Best Years of Our Lives. And last but not the least, born in Texas, we have Frank Robinson, 1935. Um, he is an American Baseball Hall of Fame outfielder and manager. Uh, he became an MVP in 1961 in 1966 there we go all right place of the week we have uh, singapore we'll talk about the national symbols let's start off with the lion and you know the lion how many how many times did we showcase the lion already not just uh as a national symbol but also animal of the day right so instead of focusing on on the animal itself we're going to talk about uh, what it symbolizes, and you should have an idea already too, you know. Uh, but uh, there's some interesting um, information about why Singapore considered the lion to be their national animal. 
So the lion head symbolizes, or the lion itself symbolizes uh, courage, strength, and excellence. Um, it is in solid red against a white background uh, for their uh, emblem, you know, the colors of the, their national flag. Um, the name or the main has five partings that represent the same five ideals embodied in the five stars of the national flag, namely democracy, peace, progress, justice, and equality. The lion's tenacious uh, main symbolizes the uh, nation's single-minded resolve to face and overcome any challenges. So, yes, because you know a lot of people consider lion to be not just the king of the jungle, but also being a majestic uh, symbol or a majestic creature, you know? Like, yeah, if you look at the picture of a lion right here, it, it looks wild. At the same time, it looks elegant. You know, it, it looks fancy. Um, th that's how I see a lion. <laughs> I mean, like, of course, I'm going to get scared if I uh, get close to a lion. But I appreciate how beautiful um, they look like as a... Uh, as, as uh, being out there in the wild, you know? Um, anyways, Singapore's name, you know, Singapore, name Singapore, its name actually was derived from uh, the word me, that means Lion City, Singapura. There you go, that's why Singapore. Um, their name actually means Lion City. Um, according to the Mal Malay Annals, Sang Nila Utama, the, a prince from Palembang gave this name to the island after he came ashore and saw a creature he believed to be a lion. So, pretty interesting. Um, next, we got the national flower, Vanda Miss Joaquim. This flower was uh, selected from among 40 flowers of orchid. By the way, this uh, flower is in the orchid family. Um, it was chosen as a national flower for its resilience and year-round blooming quality. A cross between Vanda Hukeriana and Vanda Teres, the orchid is named in the memory of Miss Agnes Joaquim, who bred the flower in her garden at Tanjong Pagar in 1893. So that's uh, Singapore's national uh, flower, <coughs> floral, em floral emblem. There you go. And then for some traditional games that I would like to introduce to you guys or talk about, we got two. <clears throat> Here's the first one. It's called Bola Team. So, what do you guys see in this on the picture? What do you guys see in the picture? If you guys are seeing uh, empty cans, then yes, you're right. Yeah, this is their their traditional one of the traditional game in Singapore, which happened to be. Also, another uh, traditional game in our country, the Philippines, but it shouldn't be a surprise considering Singapore is not far from our country. So we kind of like share a lot of, uh, of, of culture and games and, and, and other things, you know. <clears throat> so, again, wondering what to do with those empty cans of uh, condensed milk. Hey, I mean, why not make a game out of it, right? So, Bulletin is one of Singapore's traditional games that involves a pyramid of empty cans and a ball. And then, uh, the core mechanic of this game is you're gonna have two groups. One group is called the Keepers, and the other group is called the Throwers. So, pretty self-exploratory. You know, the Throwers would be, again, if you look at the pictures over there, or the picture over there, those two guys to your right, top right, uh, they're the Throwers, because you know, like <laughs> that guy just threw the ball. Uh, for some reason, I don't see any keepers, but uh, there should be a keeper. It's like a goalkeeper. You know, you gotta the keeper will be uh, responsible for keeping the pyramid stack cans uh, intact. There you go. <clears throat> it's actually fun. I played that. I remember playing that, and uh, it kind of takes some strategy too, especially if you're a thrower, because like if you're a keeper. I mean, you know, you're not like, you're not guarding or, yeah, you're, you're not guarding like a, uh, a soccer level goal, you know. It's, you see how small the pyramid of cats is right there. So, it's, it's not as big as a soccer uh, goal. So, it's pretty easy. But if you're a thrower, now that comes, uh, it's more interesting because you have to come up with some ideas on how are you going to make it bounce 
somewhere are going to trick the keeper that you're you're gonna be throwing the ball but you're not so just he would lose his focus you know those kinds of things and then the second one we have um, the marbles wonderful marbles I used to collect them too and I find them fascinating that they got some these different colors and images inside the transparent uh, uh, sphere you know pretty cool um, <clears throat> In Singapore, though, this game, traditional game, is called the Goli. Um, it's a simple game. All you have to do is draw a circle on the ground. I guess, you, uh, I'm not sure if you see the marking, but yeah. And then you're going to put the um, the marbles in there. But you have to you have to ask your opponent how many marble, marbles would you agree on putting in there. And then, yeah, and after that, whoever manages to use their own marble to... Hit another mar another marble out of the um, the circle will pocket the marble. So yeah, there you go. And uh, what else can I say? It's a it's a pretty fun game. Uh, I, I guess when you when you win. If if you don't, <laughs> then no, it's not a pretty fun game. Uh, but but I, I guess in any kinds of game, if you keep on losing, it's not it doesn't feel fun, right? But generally, it is good. It's it it actually. Um, exercise or accuracy uh, hitting those marbles they're pretty small i'm gonna say they're not as small as a bb gun but i would say about this much this this small right here so they're still kind of hard to hit so there you go our national symbols for singapore now stuff of the day here we are here we are we're gonna first talk about the animal of the day disney version we got jiminy cricket can anyone guess what kind of insect is Jiminy Cricket? If your guess is Cricket, you got that right. I'm just saying you got that right. There you go. <laughs> um, that is a picture of Jiminy Cricket from uh, which movie was it? Pinocchio. There you go. Pinocchio. But Jiminy Cricket is actually based on this animal right here. Kind of uh, looks the same, obviously. Um, crickets are insects somewhat related to grasshoppers and more closely related to bush crickets. They have somewhat flattened bodies and long antenna. Um, there are about 900 species of crickets. They tend to be nocturnal and are often confused with grasshoppers because they have similar body structure, including jumping hind legs. Um, crickets, like all other insects, are cold-blooded. They take on the temperature of their surroundings. Uh, crickets are known for their chirp. The chirp is made by raising their left forewing to a 45 degree angle and rubbing it against the upper hind edge of the right forewing, which has a thick scraper. Um, <clears throat> so their chirping doesn't come from their throat or from their mouth. Um, this sound producing action is called the stridulation, and the song is speci species specific. Oh, good luck pronouncing that. <laughs> There are two types of cricket songs, a calling song and a courting song. The calling song attracts females and repels other males, and is fairly loud. The courting song, on the other hand, is used when a female cricket is near and it's a very quiet song. Uh, so the uh, your typical cricket sound that you hear at night, those are that's more of a calling song instead of a courting song. And uh, so... It's quite interesting to know that their chirping doesn't actually come from their from their throats or their mouth, you know. Uh, another interesting thing is that they can also hear those chirps, but uh, their ears are not really located on their head, you know, not like us. Um, crickets have ears located on their knees, just below the joint of the front legs. So pretty interesting. Crickets chirp at different rates depending on their species and uh, temperature of their environment. Most species chirp at higher rates the higher the temperature is. There we go. Next up we got plan of the day, Fuchsia. 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 <laughs> Isn't this a color too? Yes, this is a color too. Yeah, there you go. Uh, fuchsia, also known as the ladies Eardrop is a bushy plant that belongs to the family of evening primrose. There you go. It originated from Chile, Argentina, and Mexico. 
Uh, there are more than 100 species and numerous varieties of fuchsia that grow in tropical and subtropical areas around the world. Fuchsia can be found from the sea level to the altitude of 13,900 feet. There you go. Wow, it's pretty high. These plants were discovered at the end of the 17th century and named in honor of the famous German botanist uh, Leonhard Fuchs. Ever since that time, popularity of fuchsias um, are or is growing and today they represent one of the most cultivated ornamental plants in the world. And they're very famous for Mother's Day too. No. And other floral design, interior design. I mean, come on. Uh, you can't always have rose to be on the on the on the top of of uh, of the tier list for a beautiful flower, right? You gotta give a chance to other flowers that actually look good too, and they shine on their own beauty. Fuchsia, right there, right there. <laughs> you know what else is beautiful? Our last Whitney Houston. Um, song that we're gonna be talking about for this month because next month well we're gonna be moving to a different a different artist or maybe a band or maybe a boy band or maybe a girl group we'll see um, but for our last Whitney Houston song we got all at once 1985 it is from her debut album Whitney Houston and was released as a single in several European countries as well as in Japan between 1985 to 1986. It was not released as a single in North America, but uh, did receive steady radio airplay on pop and R&B soul stations here. Um, it is a ballad that about um, a love who lives without warning and a heartbreak uh, that is felt afterwards. A sad song, you know. It's still a good song though. Um, it became the first hit for Whitney Houston in the Netherlands in April 1985 and also top 5 hit on Italy and Belgium singles chart. There we go. Alright, we're getting close to the end of today's show. Um, recovery word of the day. R-E-C-O-V-E-R-Y. Recovery. There you go. It is a noun and it means a return to a normal or a healthy condition. Now, um, just a quick reminder: recovery it doesn't just applies to your physical aspect. You know, uh, it also applies to your mental aspect, and psychological. So there you go, recovery. Uh, here's an example at the bottom part. She is hoping for a fast and full recovery. There we go. And last part, finally, at the end of the. Uh, episode Tech Trivia The first cell phone call was in New York City In 1973 The first ever mobile phone call Was made by Martin Cooper Martin Cooper An employee of Motorola Oh wow <laughs> I mean Motorola, come on You guys have heard about that company uh, Back in the day it was uh, the, the cellular phone uh, providers Or not, not providers but more like uh, Manufacturers, that's what I meant would be Nokia is big in our in the Asian countries. I'm not sure if it was big here in the U.S. BlackBerry, however, very big here in the U.S. Uh, Motorola, that's one too. Samsung was making phones uh, already uh, early on. Uh, Sony or Ericsson at first. Ericsson, but then uh, I believe Ericsson was uh, bought out by Sony, so their phone line. Be was was branded as Sony Ericsson. There you go. Some extra more uh, information or extra more trivia about cell phones. Anyways, it wasn't until 19 years later when Neil Papsworth sent the first text message or SMS message. So, uh, first it was the call and then the message uh, 19 years later. Pretty interesting. Pretty interesting. Now, a lot of people um, are... They, they prefer sending text messages now um, not because uh, I mean for me I think calling is still faster you know um, especially you cannot you're not supposed to be calling and driving you, you're not supposed to be using your phone while driving but texting while driving is way worse than than uh, having you know calling plus a lot of these cars these days now they have uh, what do you call this they, they do have 
like a sync like it's your phone syncs in your car so you don't even have to press anything you can actually command your car to to answer the call or something so you're not taking your eyes out of the road but for texting though uh you, if especially we're going to be doing it manually then you have to look in your phone and then you're driving and then you're you misspell the word you look at your phone again oh no that's never a good idea never a good idea guys got to be safe when you drive so there you go um that is it <laughs> for our show today guys thank you so much for sticking with me um uh, i hope you learned something new i hope you guys enjoy i hope uh, you guys find our episode interesting for today um and and i always encourage you guys to uh you know talk to me in the comment section below don't forget to leave your thoughts about the topics we were talking about for this episode so anyways goodbye august welcome september so i'll see you guys next month next episode my next episode will be next month but technically it's just few days after this so yes all right well stay safe guys and uh be happy always bye for now